I've got a bad feeling about this. An introduction to Yakut religion. It has a deeply fatalistic attitude to future events and human destiny. It is believed that even before a person is born, his fate, either on the sixth or the seventh of the nine higher heavenly worlds, is written down in the death notebook by one of the supreme deities. Khan. Yes, yes, Genghis Khan, everyone got that right. I was curious at the things a man had to do for his name to become a symbol of the supreme deity of destiny in the East Pradesh Kensky tribe. Then I looked at the Mongol Empire, and basically everything became clear. So, the moment a person is born, his future is essentially already determined, no free will. Hence all this rich assortment of peeking into the future, fortune telling, prophecies, lucid dreams, etc. in Yakut folklore, if the future is static, it means one can at least try to get some information from it. Actually, that is why the tradition of Christmas holidays was so easily incorporated into local customs, and people, horses, Sulyukuns, and spirits got mixed up there. And if we're talking about a person's destiny, the situation is like this, if you have a full destiny, Butunaru. literally made whole, written down in heaven, then you don't care about all the hardships, suffering, twists and turns of life and your own dickheadedness. You can put nails in the sockets with your bare hand and you'll be fine. But if you have an incomplete destiny, i.e., not fully made, you can try your best, you're fucked 100%. You'll die in the prime of life, healthy as a horse, from some meteorite that falls right on your head. That's the way the world works. Next, two stories about people with a full fate. First story. Everything happened, again, like in the good old early 1800s, in pre-revolutionary times. Once upon a time, in a dense corner of Yakutia, there lived a small Toyan prince who knew no trouble and oppressed the working people. But he got fed up with his fat old wife, who also turned out to be infertile, and he started having affairs. So much so that one of his young maids from a poor family, servants of the rich in Yakutia are still called Ham Nashid, literally mercenary, bore him a baby boy. The prince's wife did not like all this, but you can't blame her husband. In the patriarchal Yakutia of the 19th century, rigid Sutkinism was not just the norm, but an obligatory element in a family of any wealth. Nothing could be done with the girl, she was now under the roof of a husband mad with happiness. In general, the nobility bastards were treated much better in Yakut society than in Europe. The woman decided to eliminate the baby. To end this, she went to another family, to the local shaman who was considered predatory and could secretly perform the work of a fingerless killer for a decent fee. The woman brought money and presents to the shaman and subtly hinted that it would be good if the newborn suddenly died, a common occurrence at that time, no one would suspect anything. The shaman agreed, accepted the presents, sent his client, and all neighbors, away from his tent, and in the evening began the ritual. He made a ritual, called his unclean servants, and at the end stomped his foot on the ground, cabins of that time had no floor, the ground fell in, formed a hole, which quickly filled up with black water, dead water. The shaman took a piece of birch bark, put the baby spirit in it, and sent it swimming through that water. The task was for the shaman or his henchman spirits to throw stones at this spark. As soon as he succeeded in knocking down the ship and plunging it entirely into the dead water, the infant was doomed. The shaman picked up stones, shot at the bark, missed. Once more, taking aim, again, missed. He used up all the stones, went to get new ones, and called his minions to help. Anyway, this angry bird-esque Benny Hill thing went on until dawn, and every rock in the neighborhood went to work. Not once did they hit. It wasn't that the ship was dodging on purpose, just that his eyesight was failing the shaman, or his hands, or some other accident. And with the first rays of the sun, water leaked somewhere inside, the hole overgrown. When the customer visited, the broken-hearted shaman told him that the baby was full of fate and that there was nothing he could do about it, and warned the woman not to try to get involved again. Because she would only make things worse for herself. But he did not return the presents and the money, as he wasted the whole night, wasting his energy. The second story. From some elements of it in my childhood I cringed, even had nightmares. 
In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, it became popular among the adventurers of Yakutia, who were not satisfied with a quiet peaceful life of poverty, to go to the gold mines in Bodaibo in search of happiness. Many dark stories happened there, fortunes were earned and lost overnight, a lot of blood spilled in the taiga. The roads leading there and back were especially dangerous, bandits could be waiting for travelers with their hard-earned money and gold at any turn. And so, one such young man, fed up with working at the mines, wanted to go home to his mother and father. He quit his job, took the money with him, and set off across the taiga to Yakutsk. He was not involved in anything criminal, he was an honest laborer at the mines, so his conscience was clear. At some point the road led him to one of the many taiga staging posts, a relatively safe place to spend the night under a roof, with a lock on the door and some kind of security provided by the owners. For a small fee, of course. In general, the situation is standard, and one could see that the owner was experienced and reliable, and the hut was strong, with thick log walls. Only it turned out that there are no places in the house, everything is packed, so the newcomer was offered to stay in the barn. The lad was very tired after the trip and he was not very picky, the barn is the same as the house, there are no windows and there is no bolt from the inside, nobody can get in. In the barn there was a trestle bed just for this case, the host put the linen on it and soon the traveler fell asleep. He dreamed that he was lying on the same trestle bed in the same barn. But he could not move, well, as it happens in a dream. And under the couch there happens some kind of commotion, as if some people were whispering and sobbing. The boy turns his head sideways and sees in the dim light of the moon shining through the tiny window, some naked woman crawling out from under the bed on all fours. She crawled out, stood up, looked back at him, and the guy was horrified. The woman looked young and beautiful, except that her whole body was broken, terribly bruised and open, her throat was cut and her tongue was hanging out of her throat. She walked over to the bed, bent down, and kissed the boy on the lips. The kiss turned out to be icy, and it made the guy wake up in a cold sweat. He lay there, hyperventilating, unable to calm down. He decided to go outside and get some air. Goes to the door, tries to open it. No, it's locked on the other side. That's when he got a bucket of cold water. He barely touched the internal deadbolt, and it fell off at once. It turned out to be just for show, it didn't hold anything. It was a trick. The lad remembered about the dream, jumped to the couch, dragged it to another place, looked closely at the floor. There's a door to the entrance to the cellar, carefully disguised. He got hold of the heavy door, lifted it up somehow, and there was a deep cellar, with a fierce frost breeze blowing from it. The guy took a match out of his pants pocket, he was a smoker, lit one, looked down and freaked out again. Deep down in the frosty basement there were naked human bodies lying in different poses, apparently, they had been dumped from above. At the top of the pile was the same woman who the boy had dreamed of, with exactly the same wounds. Her eyes were open. The lad recoiled from the pit put out the match. It all became clear, the owner was a robber, and some guests with money were killed at night in this barn and robbed. There is even no need to take the bodies out, the deep hole in the permafrost do their job. He began to think feverishly about what to do. In the meantime, some quiet voices and whispers had already been heard in the yard. It was the darkest hour of the night, and it was clear that the robbers were on their way to kill him. The lad had nothing to do but to quickly close the cellar door put the couch back in place, spread his outer clothes under the blanket as if a man were sleeping there, armed himself with a fake deadbolt, and froze near the door. From the sound of footsteps, four men approached the barn. Trying not to rattle the keys, one of them opened the lock and swung the door open. As soon as the door opened, the other two ran inside and started beating the man on the trestle with their iron crowbars. The guy decided not to waste the moment and jumped out of the barn, and at the same time he hit the master with the deadbolt who was standing at the threshold with the keys. While the fourth man with the knife, standing a little to the side, was confused for a second, the guy was already on the move towards the exit of the yard. The chase lasted a quarter of an hour. The lad was a good runner, but the pursuers proved to be physically fit as well. In the end, when the lad was exhausted and the bandits were on his heels, a deep, steep ravine a few meters wide appeared beside the road. It seemed completely impossible to jump over but the desperate lad decided to take his last chance, took a leap and jumped. He barely made it, almost slipped on the edge, but kept his balance and kept running. The first of the bandits, who had also decided to play Neo, did not make it and collapsed screaming to the bottom. The second bandit understood the situation, stopped at the ravine and shouted after the fleeing guy something like, well, fuck, what a full fucking fate you have, kid. And indeed, the guy lived a long life, 
Although he got into the most terrible trouble, he crossed the Taiga more than once, fought for both the Whites and the Reds after the Revolution, went through World War II and died an old man under Brezhnev, being a respected veteran with a lot of medals and titles. The 18th century, a dense winter taiga somewhere near the Vali Yur River. A certain traveler on a horse was on his way to another village, but for some reason he was late, and it became clear that he would not make it to his destination before sunset. In this case, there are empty barns in the glades alas along the roads, either specially built as trail stops, or once inhabited, but for some reason abandoned. Without thinking twice, the traveler steered his horse to one of such huts, familiar to him. He reached the needed hut at dusk and on the way, he noticed that the light was shimmering in the windows, the smoke was buzzing and sparks were flying out of the chimney. The traveler was only glad that he would not have to spend the night alone, and it was nice to come to the already heated and prepared for the night lodging. There was a horse and a cart at the mare's stall, and the traveler immediately felt like the last beggar, a luxurious thoroughbred horse of snow-white suit, almost twice the size of his own workhorse, and an expensive cart, not from a small workshop, all painted with bright colors with soft seats and everything else that was extremely rare in those days, and in such a wilderness. In general, it was clear that not just anyone, but some toy or rich merchant was staying overnight in the cabin. The traveler hesitated, but what could he do, he could not go back at night. He dismounted from his horse and tried to lead him to the stable, but he stubbornly refused to approach to the white horse, which just looked contemptuously at the newcomers and lazily chewed the hay scattered under the fodder. The man decided that his horse was also embarrassed by such noble company, and let him graze in the alas, finding his sustenance under the snow. After brushing the snow off his clothes and cleaning himself as best he could, he opened the door of the ramshackle and stepped inside. Inside it was indeed very cozy, wood in the stove was crackling, broth was boiling, white bread and other delicacies were put on the table, there was a full bottle of wine. But, the sight of the owner of all this good was shocking for the traveler. It was a Russian woman tall, burly, with long lush red hair that she combed by the stove when the guest entered. There was a hitch. The guest was stumbling at the entrance, not knowing what to do, of course he could not speak Russian, and the woman was looking at the man curiously, without any embarrassment or fear, and was silent too, evidently, she did not know Yakut. The man even thought about leaving for the night, but then the woman smiled, said something in Russian and with a gesture invited him to take off his clothes and sit down at the table. Well, if the woman asks. So, the traveler sat down at the table, feeling as if in a dream. The woman, meanwhile, finished brushing her hair and also sat down to dinner. She began to say something enthusiastically, pointing to himself, then to the window, apparently, talked about who she was and how she had got here. The man only had to nod and nod as if he understood something. He decided to himself that it was most likely a merchantess from Irkutsk, who was going through Vili Yudhiyakutsk on her own business. Of course, it was a dangerous venture for a woman with such a posh horse, cart and, obviously, money to go through the taiga alone, but who knows the habits of these Russians. Meanwhile, the woman poured wine in two glasses, cut some bread and ham, went to get some broth, and the guest began to eat. At first, he chewed just for the sake of appearance, feeling that he was not on his own plate, and then tiredness and the fact that since the morning he had it not a crumb in his mouth began to make itself felt. He ate everything that was offered and asked for more, which was not denied. Then the wine hit his head, pleasant warmth spread over the body, and now the man is not only giving in to the woman's story, but he is telling her the whole history of his family up to the fifth tribe, and the woman is nodding and laughing as if she understands everything. The fire in the stove is getting brighter and brighter, it's already hot in the hut, sweat is rolling down his forehead, the man takes off his winter shirt at the woman's suggestion, and then the woman asks him to take off his top coat as well. The bottle of wine is already empty, and the woman pulls out a second one from somewhere, with an even stronger potion. As a result, the man is dead drunk, and the red-headed woman is already openly hinting at love games and drags him to the trestle bed. Not believing that such a winter fairy tale happened just to him, the man does his thing and then falls into a deep drunken sleep. He wakes up in the dead of night from the cold penetrating his entire body. It turns out that he is lying half-naked on a trestle bed in a dark, unheated ramshackle house and his limbs are already stiff. His head still hurts from the wine fumes. He gets up, looks around, does not understand anything, there is no woman, no food, no wine, nothing, and it does not seem that all this was here at all. No one has been in the booth for at least a few months. After putting on his clothes, scattered all over the tent, the traveler went out to his horse grazing in the distance, noticing along the way that there is neither that handsome racehorse, nor hay, 
nor horse traces under the mare, the snow crust is untouched. In the morning he reaches the nearest village, firmly resolving not to tell anybody anything, if he is not considered crazy, then they will laugh, who will believe that he spent the night with a noble Russian merchant's wife in a roadside lodging. Only his state of health gets worse and worse, the headache do not go away, chills, vomiting, pain in the body begins. Barely returning back to his village, the man fell ill and never got up again. Only before he died did he tell what had happened to him that night. But his death was only the first. In the two villages he visited, people also began to fall ill, and within days the disease was spreading throughout the Ullis. The death toll was in the hundreds, then thousands, entire families and villages were dying out. The terrible epidemic mowed down people like straws, and those who survived were left with disfigured bodies forever. Smallpox. It was her spirit, it was said later, that appeared from the west in the remote Vilayi in the form of a red-haired Russian woman in search of victims, and she got her fill that winter. P.S. Smallpox epidemics before the revolution did periodically wipe out large parts of the population of Yakutia, even in areas remote from the trade routes. The Yakut people's perception of the spirit of smallpox as a beautiful rich Russian woman with red hair was quite commonplace. In principle, everything is clear, smallpox was brought to Yakutia via trade routes from the Irkutsk region, the first carriers were Russians, hence this personification. The following story is interesting because it is a kind of mirror version of the old story about the invisible demonic cohabitator, which is very popular in Yakutia, and a folklore attempt to explain logically what is happening, as far as that word applies here at all. I will present the story on the basis of a story by the writer. Platon Slipsofaunskip, named Buta, that is, how Yakut was an evil man, Abasi. However, I read this story a billion years ago. So something is sure to forget or get confused with elements of other folklore, but whatever. The initial situation is standard, as in 90% of other Yakut horror stories, 19th century, from point A to point B set out a young hustler, but because of the chronic inability to time planning, darkness caught him on the road in the woods. In addition, a real storm began with the wind, bending the trees, thunder and lightning, and the traveler had nothing to do but to sit down by the trunk of the nearest large tree so that its branches and leaves could somehow protect him from the raging elements. It didn't help, the hurricane was so strong that he was soaked through in a moment anyway, and the wind took such an unbelievable sweep that soon the man felt his feet lift off the ground and he ceased to see it all behind the mist and noise, what was going on and where he was. His heart sank and the traveler prepared for death, but soon the forces of nature gave way a little, and he found himself somehow sitting on a large haystack in a backyard. Realizing that a mighty wind had carried him from the woods to the village without dropping him to his death, the boy exhaled, clutched his heart, and jumped briskly from the haystack. It was here that the first oddities came to light. First, there was no storm or wind, unless it managed to dissipate in a few seconds. But there was none of the disorder and destruction that such a strong wind should have caused. Secondly, the boy had a feeling that there was something wrong all around. The yard was something subtly different from those in his village or in the neighboring ones, and the starry sky looked different, and in general, the atmosphere was alien, although it did not seem possible to cling to each particular element, it looks like a usual autumn evening, a simple Yakut courtyard of a middle-class family, a barn, a stable, haystacks, cows dozing peacefully in their stalls. In general, the guy thought for a while and decided not to bother with nonsense, and to be glad that he was alive. He shook himself off fixed his hair and went to the cabin to ask the hosts where he was and how to get home. It was dinner time in the hut, and there were three people sitting at the table, an old man, an old woman and a young girl in her twenties, evidently their daughter. There was hot beef soup on their plates, and people were eating in silence, as if disturbed by something. When the guy came in, the door of the banquet creaked loudly as it closed, to which all three of them turned suspiciously. The guy greeted politely according to the Akut custom and asked the hosts how they were doing. And he was very surprised when no one answered him, after a second pause, all three of them continued to eat their soup again. While the guest was standing in confusion, the old woman started a conversation. Oh, did you see that? A few minutes ago a strange black whirlwind fell from the sky on the haystack in the yard. It's no good, no good. Shut up, you fool. The old man interrupted her nervously. You make up things and see things that are not there. There was no whirlwind. The girl was silently frightened by this talk and her eyelashes fluttered. Hey, masters, can you hear me? The boy asked irritably. You have a guest, and I want to ask. 
The girl abruptly turned around and looked straight at the lad. The old man and the old woman looked at her with surprise. What's the matter, chick? Just some ringing in my ears. The girl answered uncertainly. And a minute ago, as if a door creaked. The old woman carefully touched the girl's forehead. It doesn't look hot. Honey, you need to go to bed early tonight. Holy shit, our hero finally realized. So, they can't see or hear me. To experiment, he stepped into the light closer to the table and defiantly started pacing back and forth, but the three at the table continued to ignore him. It was at this point that the boy's adventurous spirit, or his pioneering curiosity, or, more likely, his usual hooliganism and dickheadishness, kicked in. Noticing an extra chair in the corner, obviously saved for the guests, he dragged it closer to the table, took an extra bowl, kaja, from the shelf, scooped up soup from the pot up to the edges, sat down at the table opposite the old man and began to eat with appetite. The house people only rounded their eyes, and the silence became absolute. The girl dropped her spoon from her hand altogether. After a few minutes, the old woman, having recovered from prostration, muttered barely audible. I told you, not good. It seems that we have an extra eater. The old man did not object this time, only whispered faintly, squeezing the hand of his daughter pale as chalk. Perhaps. There was no more talk that evening. The hosts quickly finished dinner and got ready for bed, as if they hoped to finish the day quickly so that everything would be back to normal in the morning. The boy, embarrassed by his own impudence and the fact that he had frightened people so much, sat quietly and peacefully on the sidelines. In the meantime, the old man had put out the flame in the stove, it became dark in the cabin, and everyone scattered to their corners. Soon the old man's thunderous snoring could be heard in the darkness. Well, our guy, as you understand, under the circumstances, could not remain reasonable for long. This time, the attack of adventurism joined spermatoxicosis and the game of hormones, and all attention of our hero gradually shifted to the boudoir in the corner, Kopikshi, in fact, just a place separated with a screen or planks, where the girl was sleeping. Ten minutes he was patient, twenty minutes he was patient, but he did not have enough will for thirty minutes, a guy sneaked into the boudoir, he looked, a girl was sleeping half naked, wearing only a nightgown, also beautiful and defenseless. Well, the guy put his mind on 100% autopilot and got to her. The screams of the awakened girl were such that they could wake up half of the village. An old man and an old woman ran into the boudoir and tried for a long time to calm the shocked, crying daughter. The boy, himself fucked up from what he had done, ran away to a far corner and there looked under his feet. Finally, the old man said something like, enough of this, and left his daughter in the old woman's care, hastily dressed himself, and went off somewhere. He came back not alone, but with an elderly shaman in full attire, shaman's clothes, a tambourine, everything. The shaman looked around the banigan, a little bit staring at the corner, where our guy was. This gave the invisible guest goosebumps. The incantation began. An old man with an old woman and a weeping girl sat aside, reverently watching the shaman's dance. The shaman was making a long shamanic ritual, and with time the boy began to feel obvious discomfort. Every movement of the shaman began to cause an unbearable burning inside the body, and the beats of the tambourine were accompanied by a ticking of the heart. Finally, the shaman, without stopping the Kamlala, began to speak in a thunderous voice. Terrible misfortune has befallen your family. A disgusting creature of the underworld, an unclean spirit has appeared in your courtyard to take your daughter and his wife and drag her away with him to his world, to enjoy her torment there forever. I see him. There stands in the corner, absorbing the greedy burning gaze of his yellow eyes upon your daughter's breast. Oh boy! I can do nothing, the glare of his hungry eyes blinds me. The girl burst into tears again. The old man and the old woman fell to their knees, begging the shaman to do something. Oh boy! The shaman continued to ravage. What can I stand against the ancient power of those distorted lands from whence he came? Help me, forces of light, help me, supreme yura yungar toyon. Let me send this vile creature back to where it belongs. Get out, woman. Get out, father. With these last shots the shaman struck the tambourine three times, with his other hand pointing straight at the guy, who had been freaking out about the whole thing. It was as if the blows had fallen right on his head, and the guy lost consciousness. Came to his senses by the trunk of the same tree he'd been hiding under from the storm. The original power of the elements had passed, the thunderstorm had ceased and only a faint rain was pouring from the dark sky. The traveler lay on his stomach, as if he had tripped over something, convulsively clenching his hands into fists. He came to his senses, stood up, looked around, nothing hurt, 
his arms and legs were moving. In deep thoughtfulness he went on his way, not understanding what it was just now, a dream, a reality or something else. Many years later, having turned into a drunkard, the guy, every time he got drunk, pestered every passerby with the proposal to tell him an incredible story about how once Yakut was a devil, but, naturally, no one believes such a crazy tale. Central Yakutia, 1970s. We will talk about a villager, who eventually moved to the city, but did not forget about his roots and once a year regularly went on vacation for a long hunt in the taiga, in fact, many still do so, my boss at the former workplace took a couple of weeks of vacation along with his gun as soon as the snow came. Usually, just in case, such events are attended by a bunch of well acquainted, trusted people, but this one liked to hunt alone. So what, the place is familiar, the woods known to him well, as a committed communist does not believe a bit in the supernatural nonsense, and the real dangers of the faithful shotgun is always on hand. And so, he put forward for another long hike, reached the last village near the river, where the road ended, and then on the Buren on the frozen river for a hundred miles downstream, where the virgin uninhabited forest and alone hunting lodge on the shore stood, surrounded by a high board fence so that animals could not get in. He arrived, as usual, unpacked in the hut, sacks with cereals, bread, etc., to sustain him for half a month, even if the patron of hunting Bayanai did not bless the hunter this time, and the prey would be scarce. He slept in the first day and started the usual hunting cycle, skiing, shotgun slash rifle depending on the purpose of today's hike, then comes the skill of a pathfinder. Things were going well, in the first week he shot not only small game, but a whole elk. He already began to think that, probably, it would take him several trips to take all this stuff to the village as the Buren would not fit in at once. By sunset of the new day, he returned to the cabin in a good mood with a couple of hares and grouse over his shoulder. He went inside, lit candles, stoked the stove, and then noticed something wrong, some traces on the floor, wet from thawing snow, a strange smell, and to top it all off, the bags with provisions were torn and a decent part of the stored bread and sweets was gone. Here it is necessary to notice, that outside the door of the hut was not locked because in the deep wood there is no need, and the fence protects from accidental beasts, the hunter thought at first it was a fox, squirrels and other small animals, but quickly abandoned this theory, the tracks are not similar, and the behavior is not the same. Well, a fox could not tear the rough canvas bag and carry away so much food, and there were no signs that the bread and candy was eaten on the spot, no crumbs, no wrappers. There was clearly a man at work here, but where would he come from without any transportation in this desolate land? It became unsettling. The hunter came out of the cabin and looked for tracks, but nothing but his own were imprinted in the snow. He thoughtfully went back inside, loaded the gun, locked the door, put curtains up and slept that night with a shotgun under the bed. He woke up several times during the night because he thought he heard snow creaking near the cabin and some quiet muttering, but every time he listened, it stopped, and the hunter wrote it off as a hallucination of anxiety. The next day it was very cold and there was a blizzard in the woods, so the hunter returned earlier than usual. He entered the courtyard and noticed the door of the hut was wide open. The hunter rushed forward as he knew, there was a cold snap in the cabin, the wind was blowing, almost all sacks with food had disappeared, and this time an unknown fiend took away also some meat, the spoils of the previous days. Going outside he could still not find any trace of the intruder. That's when the hunter became angry. He decided that runaway convicts were to blame for everything and decided to make a profit at his expense, though there were no camps in his neighborhood. Determined to catch the intruders red-handed and punish them severely, he went to bed. The night passed restlessly again. The feeling did not leave him that he was not alone in the deep taiga and that somebody was watching him intently. The sun rose. After having breakfast with scanty leftovers of the food he had brought with him, the hunter took his gun and went hunting. But this time he went quite far away, to the nearest ravine and concentrated his attention on listening. The snow had stopped blizzarding, it was sunny. The air was conducting the sounds wonderfully and the fresh snow from the previous day creaked happily at the slightest touch. If anyone showed up at the cabin, an experienced hunter should have heard it. The day was drawing to a close, dusk was gathering around him, and the man continued to sit and wait. He was sure that the mysterious thief would come today, but time passed, and no sounds came from outside the cabin, except the usual crackling of twigs in the frost. Only when the sun had finally set, the moon had risen, and the forest was colored silvery blue, the frozen hunter admitted his mistake, spat on everything, got out of the ravine and moved to the cabin. He stepped into the yard and froze in surprise, the door of the hut was wide open, and there was obviously someone in it. 
After recovering from the first shock, the hunter quietly removed the shotgun from his shoulder and disengaged the safety. There were indistinct sounds coming from the cabin, hoarse heavy breathing, heavy footsteps, incessant indecipherable whispers, interspersed with guttural sighs. The hunter began to wonder if a man was capable of making such noises, but there was no time to hesitate. He cautiously walked around the side of the hut along the well-trodden path in the snow to the stack with his rifle at the ready, trying not to crunch the snow, and peered through the window. From the other side there was looking at him, too. A broad face, covered in black furry fur, with tiny shiny eyes and a half-grinned mouth with big teeth. The hunter had no time to be frightened or react at all. Just at that moment, someone on the roof of the hut laughed in a human voice and jumped right on top of him, knocking him to the ground and pressing down on him with its considerable mass. The hunter was about to kiss his life goodbye, but the one who had attacked him did not attack again, and with the agility of a circus performer, without ceasing to laugh, jumped straight back onto the roof before he could get a good look at him. While the hunter was climbing up, the one inside the hut also jumped out onto the porch with guttural laughter, and from there to the roof in one fell swoop. When at last the hunter, covered with snow, reached the porch, two dark silhouettes in the moonlight, one larger, the one in the cabin, the other smaller, the one who jumped from the roof, leapt from the roof to the fence, and from there to the branches of a nearby large, without ever touching the ground. The eldest was clutching in one of his, hands? Pause. The last sack of bread the man had brought from the village. Watching as the two men moved quickly, jumping from tree to tree and laughing wildly, into the forest, the hunter finally realized who had been paying him a visit all this time. In his hand remained a clump of stiff black hair, torn from the alien's body from the rooftop during the fall and the brief struggle. Chu Chun Na, he whispered. There was no point in staying any longer, the intruders could return at any moment and pull another joke, not so harmless. As soon as dawn broke, the hunter loaded the Buran with all his loot and drove back to the people. Having thought a little, he decided not to take the remains of the human food with him, and left everything on the table, so that those who apparently were so fond of it, could eat it. P. S. Chu Chu Na, emphasis on the last syllable, is the acute equivalent of Bigfoot. The legends about forest people, overgrown with black fur and possessing amazing physical strength and agility, had been known in Yakutia since long ago. They are not usually considered evil by default, but if you provoke them, you only have to blame yourself. For some reason, almost all the stories about Chuchu Nu I have heard always mention their loud laughter, which is indistinguishable from human laughter, and in situations where it is not funny from a human point of view. Apparently, the humorists of the forest have a different opinion. In the far north of Yakutia, where the glorious Indigurka River flows into the East Siberian Sea, there is a village called Ruskastai with a unique history in its own way. It is believed to have been founded by Novgorod Palmers who fled from the horrors of the Oprishnina in the 16th century, when Russian Cossacks had not yet annexed Yakutia to Russia. It was in the vicinity of Ruskastai in the early 1920s that the following story took place. Times were harsh. Two wars had just broken out, World War I and the Civil War, and in the latter the Reds had won, of which, however, people in such remote fucking places were little aware of. To remedy the situation, a proven comrade who had been through the trenches of the Civil War was dispatched from Yakutsk. Let's call him Sergei. The task was to politically enlighten the dark population of the Northern Ulysses and explain to them that from now on one should not pray to God or the Tsar, but to Lenin and Trotsky. The roads in those days were, well, as they are now, so it took a long time for Sergei to get there. At last, he arrived and began methodically to bypass the villages scattered on tundra, in each of which he gathered all inhabitants in one building and carried out explanatory work, answered questions. People listened without enthusiasm, nodded, then dispersed to their homes and continued to live as before. And then, in one of these villages, there was a hitch. When Sergei moved on from the political part of the lecture to the atheistic part, saying that blood-drinking priests had been profiting from people's fears and ignorance for centuries, and that there really were no supernatural powers, someone shouted from the floor. You talk so confidently about it, but how do you explain what's going on in the hermit's house? It turns out the following. Some distance from the village in the tundra there is a house. Some crazy old hermit built it, but he died a few years ago and they buried him behind his own cabin. Over time, the house became a convenient resting place for travelers and hunters, and it was then that people began to realize that the house is not simple, but troubled. Terrible things were told, at night someone dragged people from their beds, the rooms were filled with the screams and groans of an old man dying. 
and the hermit himself was seen rising from his coffin. Those who passed by the house in the dark hours of the day, noticed the candle flame in the window, and the old hermit was sitting at the table, with a saddened expression, in this wavering light. Sergei, naturally, grinned to himself and tried to explain that such spooks exist in every village, and that people's imagination and superstition give rise to such hermit houses. The people strongly disagreed with him, many people said that they personally experienced not the most pleasant moments in the hermit's house. And then Sergei, in order to bring the light of truth to the people, took a desperate step. It is decided, he said. I will spend the night in your hermit's house tonight to personally prove that no evil can and cannot exist there. People fell silent, some weakly tried to dissuade him from this venture, saying that it would be worse, but in general people were impressed, what Sergei wanted. The smallest thing remained, to spend the night in the specified house. It was even convenient for Sergei, he had to sleep somewhere and start the next day again. And here he had the whole house at his disposal. However, the coachman, who drove him during his entire mission, flatly refused to go with Sergei to the unclean place and by the kind permission of the head of the village settled in his house. The locals showed Sergei how to get to the cursed house, but no one would escort him. The brave Bolshevik took a sack of provisions, checked if his trusty revolver was all right and set off into the tundra. The grey winter twilight was gathering around. He came to the hermit's house after dark, almost got lost in the tundra. It looked like a simple and sturdy log cabin, and it was evident that at one time it was actively used by the local population. Here was an old wood pile around the corner, and the water basin was half full. Sergei entered the house and found there a Russian oven, a table, chairs, a simple wooden bed and even a boiler for water. His spirits lifted, and whistling courage, comrades, in stride. He began to make himself comfortable in the place for the night. He stoked the stove with the remains of wood, gathered snow into the cauldron, put it on the stove and, when the snow melted, diluted water with the soup concentrate he brought with him. When the fire began to flare up and the house became warm, he undressed, put his weapon on the table, and went around the rooms. Everywhere was empty, as it should be, but he was surprised by the lack of dust and mustiness that are characteristic of abandoned houses. After his inspection, Sergei went outside to take a leak. It was a frosty, dark evening, and the sky was dotted with stars. Sneezing, Sergei quickly did his business in the latrine, and on his way back almost running, suddenly stopped when he noticed something unbelievable. Someone's twisted shadow slid clearly through the window, illuminated by the flame of the stove. Despite all his atheism, Sergei felt goosebumps run down his back. But he quickly pulled himself together and, chalking it up to an illusion of vision, he hopped into the house. Of course, no one was inside, only the soup was boiling on the stove, spreading its aroma around the house. During dinner Sergei felt dense, now and then he froze with a spoon in his hands, grabbed his revolver and listened to the sounds. The house was quiet, only the stove was humming. Time passed, and in time he forgot all about the strange occurrence, relaxed, finished his dinner and sat down by the stove, reading the book he had brought from Yakutsk. And then something rumbled in the next room. Sergei himself did not remember how he got to his feet with a revolver in his hand. Who's there? No one answered. Sergei checked the house again, and again found nothing. He scratched the back of his head, what's going on anyway? But as soon as he returned to his book, the sounds resumed again. Some rustling and vague creeping without a clear source began to spread throughout the house. As soon as Sergei came into the room, everything stopped there, only to resume in a few moments elsewhere. Sergei was all sweaty. How could this be? Was something really going on here beyond comprehension, and had he been wrong all this time? In deep confusion he went out of the house, breathed the frosty air and regretted that he had got involved in this foolish adventure instead of sleeping sweetly in the headman's house like a coachman. He returned to the house refreshed, and the paranormal activity subsided again for a while. It was time for sleep. The stove was already giving off very little light. Sergei did not undress, stretched out on the bed as he was and tried to sleep. But it was no use, again, there were incomprehensible sounds around the house, only this time awfully similar to human whispers and moans. It's all my imagination, Sergei convinced himself, but then something happened that could not just seem, the door of the house opened by itself, the cold air crept in, and out of this haze, a decrepit coffin slipped ominously in the semi-darkness, sliding its rough boards across the floor. Sergei was dumbfounded and only watched as the lid of the coffin fell off with a crash and from there began to rise a thin skeleton like old man of a mad look. He found Sergei's gaze, and a grim grin appeared on his face. The house was filled with laughter, his laughter multiplied, spreading in different voices throughout the rooms. Sergei shook his head, 
drew his revolver from under his pillow, pointed it at the old man, and fired several times at once. The obsession did not dissipate, the smile remained on the dead hermit's face, he stretched his hand forward and opened his palm. The bullets fired at him fell to the floor with a ringing sound. The hairs on Sergei's head stirred, a primal terror gripped him. He dropped his useless revolver. Only one thought remained, how so? He was already ready to run out the window, lest he see the old recluse rise from the dead and hear the many-voiced demonic laughter that seemed to fill the whole world. At the last moment he remembered his spare Nagana, he had kept the habit of carrying two weapons with him in case one of them failed, took it out of his pocket and fired at the devil. With a cry, the old man collapsed back into the coffin. In the morning Sergei returned to the village not alone, but escorting three men at once. The fourth, an old recluse, died of his wound. It turned out to be a group of major white guard leaders, former social revolutionaries and Mensheviks, who, after the defeat of Kolshik in Siberia, fled north to leave Russia via the East Siberian Sea. But for some reason the plan went awry, and they were stranded near the Russian estuary for the winter. In the spring, after navigation was restored, they were still to be picked up, but until then they secretly settled in the hermit's house. In order not to shine before the local inhabitants, who could easily inform the Soviet authorities about the strange strangers who appeared in the village, they simulated paranormal activity in the house, while they themselves lived in the underground cellar, the entrance to which was carefully camouflaged. They did not warm themselves with a large stove, but with a stovepipe, the smoke from which was diverted behind the nearest snowdrift and was hardly noticeable. An accomplice from the locals, who was supposed to organize the crossing, regularly brought them food and reported the latest news, he also suggested the idea to organize this whole paranormal circus, because the locals had a bad enough reputation for the house after the hermit's death, no joke, a grave under the side. He did not have time to warn them that a Bolshevik commissar was going to sleep in the house, and so the abbesses made the fatal mistake of starting to terrorize Sergei. Some doubts were raised by the revolver, in which one of them had replaced the cartridges with blanks while Sergei went to the latrine. But at that time many people even in those parts of the country had military weapons in various ways, and the presence of the revolver was taken as an occasion to put on a first-class show, which would keep curious people away from the hermit's house for a long time and allow them to survive safely until spring. But they could not know about Sergei's spare Nagana. P.S. It was pointed out to me that I fucked up a bit in this story, Russian estuary is located at 71 degrees north latitude, and there are naturally polar days and nights, so my fantasies about how it was getting dark, etc. is clearly bullshit. I should note that I was loosely retelling a story by the writer Nikolai Gabyshev from the Akut Collection 100 Stories, I don't remember the name of the story anymore, I was a total twat when I read it. Gabyshev himself lived a long time in the north of Yakutia, and every other story takes place in those places, so he himself would hardly fuck up, if I really think about it, I don't remember the daylight hours being clearly indicated in that story. I will tell you the only story where the supreme deity of the Yakut faith, your young Artoyan, translated as something like, the Great White Lord, or, the Great Lord of Light, personally appears. He sits on his throne of light in the last nine heavens, and despite the fact that all of creation in fact exists by his will, he personally, in earthly matters and affairs of the spirit world, almost does not interfere. All the more interesting is the case when a mortal did happen to see him, and the mores and tastes of the supreme deity turned out to be quite peculiar, you wouldn't understand. In fact, this is a tragic story about the fate of the last great Yakut shaman. Great not because of the shamanic classification I mentioned earlier, but because of his strength of spirit and personality. According to the official hierarchy this shaman was only average, but, as they say, with pretensions. His life fell out at a difficult time of radical changes in the Akut way of life, wars and hardships, the beginning of the 20th century. And here in the heat of civil war, seeing as the blood was flowing, a brother was cutting a brother and all norms of morality were trampled down, a shame and thought of going on a visit to your young Artoyan with a petition to intercede for the dying Yakut people and to return the balance of good and evil to the world. Only his rank did not allow him to pay such visits to the chief. After many weeks of deliberation, the shaman set out alone on a long journey north to the mouth of the Great Lena River to find there a sacred, original shaman mountain, which could give him enough power. It was a difficult thing to do, especially for an average shaman, but patience and persistence did the trick, and the barely alive shaman finally climbed to the top of the sacred mountain at dusk, seeing the river gurgling below, flowing into the cold sea. There he began the last and the most important incarnation of his life, having decided in advance that no matter what happened, 
he would not take the tambourine in his hands again. He was doing it for a long time, seven days and seven nights without stopping, crossing one level of the heavens after another, and the farther it got, the harder it got. At the third level he was chased by fire-breathing racers, patron of horses, Jisegi. Gare. Learning what mission he set himself. The shaman could barely outrun them. In who knows which heaven, he almost got scorched by thunder and lightning, sent down by the patron of the elements, Anjasan. In the higher heavens, things became quite complicated, the patron of human destinies, Genghis Khan, personally tried to stop him in the seventh heaven by burning the pages of the Book of Destinies with the shaman's fate, but even there the daredevil managed to survive, although I personally do not see how it could be done. In the penultimate eighth heaven, the shaman nearly got lost in the endless labyrinth of the patron of all creation, Odun Han, but he found his way out there as well. And so, he finally reached the ninth, higher heaven, filled with bright white light and unearthly music. Everything around him in the last heaven had only shades of white light, and only the shaman wandered around this pure world as a black spot. At last, he came to the cherished place, the throne, where a huge old man in white robes, with long white hair, white beard and with a white staff in his hand was seated. Are you Gandalf? He looked with astonishment and contempt at the ragged, bloodied and barely alive shaman, who had barely crawled to the foot of the throne and fell to his knees before the supreme deity. What do you want, you worthless medium shaman? Your young Artoyan asked. For what have you broken the order of the world and come such a long and forbidden way? The shaman began to speak. He spoke of something wrong that was going on in the middle world, that evil had raised its head and the earth had moved, of wars, fire, blood, men's and women's tears. At length he spoke, and in conclusion he asked your young Artoyan to save the people from this perdition by sending his faithful messengers down to the middle world so that they might restore the long-awaited order there. Your young Artoyan looked silently at the kneeling shaman. Then he laughed. The poor shaman, not understanding anything, listened to the mocking laughter of the deity. Finally, your young Artoyan spoke through his laughter. The earth has gone down, you say? Wars, you say, fire and blood? Save the world from destruction, you say? Send messengers, you say? He tapped his staff, and suddenly a flock of white swans with human heads began flying around the throne. Jurung Artoy and turned to them. Tell us, how are my faithful messengers doing? One of the swans sat on the old man's shoulder and spoke in a human voice. Things are better than ever. Your messengers are obediently following your orders. They have long since come down to stir up the middle world from top to bottom, like stagnant water in a tub. Oh, what glorious times await the world, you should see the wild whirlwinds sweeping through it, how hot the blood of men has become. What a frightening dawn is now shining over the horizon. Your young Artoyan turned gray and turned his gaze to the dazed shaman. Do you see? He asked angrily. Do you see now? Do you see now that your journey is futile and worthless? He tapped his staff again and burst into laughter. My Leia. A phraseology that can be translated as fucking cunt. The swans flying around the throne pounced on the shaman, cackling and hollering. My Iolea. The shaman felt his whole body grow heavy and he was rapidly flying down through the previous heavens. He woke up on top of the sacred mountain, gone for the past days to the state of a skeleton. It was a starry night, and only the sounds of the waves far below disturbed the peace. The shaman doomedly looked around, came to the edge of a cliff and threw his tambourine into the raging black waves. That was the end of the last really great Yakut shaman shamanic ritual, and since that day none of the mortals had seen the supreme deity, your young Artoyan, with her own eyes. Can you tell me more about the bottle people? I'm interested. A typical roadneck in Yakutia. I know a couple more stories like that. For example, about an old man who got drunk as a guest and expressed regret that he had never seen an Abasi in his long life, while, judging from the stories, all his fellow villagers had met at least once. Abasi has no respect for me, he said. Then he was walking home at dusk in the evening, and a rider on horseback came towards him. The old man kept walking. As he passes by, suddenly the rider grabs him by the hair without getting off the horse. The terrified old man looks up at him, and there's a fucking face, pale, elongated, toad eyes, and the rider's body, as it turns out, just goes into the horse, like a hump on the animal's back. The old man collapses with a heart attack, is discovered by other belated travelers, is barely treated, lies in the hospital for a long time, and his wife, hearing the bullshit he said before he went home that night, 
laughs and calls him a fool. Here's another road story from Yakutia. A rider on a horse rides from one village to another. It is evening, autumn, dark, only the moon's glow slightly illuminates the road. And suddenly the man is overtaken by another rider, the wind blows past. He, too, spurs his horse to overtake the braggart. After a while, he almost succeeds, but the man notices something wrong, the dim lighting shows that the horse in front looks exactly the same as his own, the height, hair, build and clothes of the man in the back are the same as his own. But who gives a fuck, he rides the horse on. Sometimes he thinks he's about to level off and overtake his rival and look at his face, but eventually he fails, the horse runs out of steam. At the fork that leads to his desired village, the front rider and his horse suddenly vanish into thin air, never letting themselves be overtaken. The man, finally realizing that this was no bullhorn at all, is covered in cold sweat and quickly steers the horse home. There, having heard that he did not manage to come first to the fork, his father is very upset, says that it is not for good, if he began to compete with the Abasi, you should have tried harder. After a couple of weeks, the man is crushed to death by a tree at the sawmill. Since we are talking about doppelgangers, I remembered something else. There is such a phenomenon in Yakut folklore, Berchjit. It is translated as the harbinger, the one who proceeds. It is a double of a person, who by his appearance or voice can appear to people before this person really comes there. It's usually thought to be normal or even a good thing, it means that this person will be okay for the foreseeable future. It's kind of like a guardian angel going around preventively in places where the person is about to go, and removing all kinds of creeps and traps of evil. My mother told me personally about an incident from her childhood. She was sitting alone in the village house on the floor, playing with dolls. Soon her father was supposed to come home from work for lunch. And then she sees, out of the corner of her eye, her father passing by the window on his usual route, and after a couple of seconds there is his distinctive coughing sound behind the wall. Her mother puts away her toys and begins to heat up the soup. She waits for her father to come in, but he is still missing. She goes outside, no one is there. Perplexed, she goes back inside, turns off the stove, continues to play further, but already in anxiety. About half an hour later, the situation repeats exactly the same, her father passes by the window, coughing, only this time he actually enters the house. My mother tells him about what happened, and he is happy, oh, my bariachit came, I'm going to be healthy, 